I don't want it. Like, I have to I mean, uh, I, I personally, like, do feel, I can project my list pretty well. If it's any way it goes, it's near it. <laughs> cool. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. So, thank you all for uh, for coming to uh, the Port Created AI of this Port. Sorry, the Port Stockholm AI Summit already. Um, I'll keep it very short since we have uh, a lot of speakers to, to go through, and luckily we, they all uh, managed to sneak in some time from some far away to still get here. Um, so for those who don't know, Stockholm AI is a, it's a summit, it's a meetup, it's a community. There's Facebook groups and, and these kind of things if you're into that. Um, but it's also a non-profit which um, operates on the umbrella of, uh, first of all, not profiting from any of this, uh, anyone personally, but then also being kind of a, a voice for the community, uh, a way where people can have dialogue and discussions about AI and the future of AI, uh, also maybe the role of AI as a as a tool for change, and then also about uh, kind of uh, the Nordic ecosystem uh, and what we might bring together uh, on this kind of gathering when we when we meet up in, in person. Um, it's startups, it's people who are interested from the, the techies, the business people. Uh, we have some uh, people from the evil side, as they call themselves, the venture capitalists. Um, <laughs> whatever, they're all welcome, and um, yeah. That, that's it, basically, that's all I have to say. Um, we're a non-profit, and basically, you're all members by just coming here. So that's awesome. Thank you for coming. Uh, Would you introduce yourself? Uh, sorry, myself. Um, so I'm co-founder of Creative AI. So I brought some of my colleagues with me as well. Uh, we build tools for creative industries using AI. That's the short version. Um, more on the website if you want to figure out what it's that about. Uh, and then I'm also a PhD student here at KTH, um, where I focus on, um, yeah, Deep learning mainly, but mostly models which learn from different kinds of modalities, and also how to use AI techniques for creative purposes. Um, and I travel between Stockholm and Amsterdam, so I'm from the, sometimes here, sometimes in Amsterdam. Um, so that's, my name is Olof Peter. Um, so the first speaker, very welcome, Jean. Thank you. Um, I'll leave it to you. Sure. Um, Uh, this is my first time in Sweden. It's very lovely. I just got here. Um, I have, I'm at the end of a like five weeks, six six weeks of travel. I've been away from home, and I I met Roloff right in the beginning of it in Amsterdam, and he invited me to this. And because I was right at the beginning of that travel, I was like, yes, <laughs> let's do it. Um, so I I actually prepared way too many slides uh, for the length of this talk. So. Um, I'm gonna like just skip some of them. I apologize for doing that in advance, but but um, I think I want to get into like the meat of this um, really quickly. Um, so yeah, my name is Gene Pilgrim. All of this stuff is online. Like everything you see is op is online, open source, so you can find it later. Um, I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but I have a background in music information retrieval. Anybody interested in MIR? Um, some people, yeah. <laughs> so that's machine learning. Sorry? Oh, I will. I will do that. Yeah. How's this? That's pretty good. Okay, I can keep that up for 20 minutes, I think. Um, so, yeah, I got started applying machine learning to audio. So this is kind of like a, in a kind of a niche field. Uh, it's undergone a lot of change over the last few years that I've been not involved in it. Uh, machine learning was really, really different at the time. Everyone kind of can remember like there was a lot of handcrafted feature extraction. So if you were doing machine learning for audio, you were basically an audio engineer. Um, and like 90% of the time, and then 10% of the time you were doing some machine learning stuff, and then you didn't know anything about computer vision, you didn't know anything about text or natural language processing, it was all these like different fields, and now it's all been sort of swallowed. Um, but because I was invested in music, there's a big ecosystem of people involved in music information retrieval who are also interested in music production technology. So uh, this is some projects that I did a few years ago, working with a friend of mine who built musical, who builds musical instruments with uh, like input with sensors on them. So touch sensors, capacitive touch sensors, an embouchure sensor on this one that's at the top here. That's called the Burl. 
It's like an electronic flute. So we would use machine learning interfaces to map the input parameters, like whatever the, the sensors were picking up, to the synthesis parameters of an electronic like music synthesizer. And so this kind of made it a lot easier to play musical instruments in some sense, because it inverts the traditional paradigm where you have to learn how to play an instrument. Instead, you kind of get the instrument to learn how to play you. And so that was kind of like, got me started. Uh, for the last few years, sorry about that. Um, I've also maintained like a practice as a, you know, what we call sort of a new media artist or a creative coder. So I'm really interested in interactive installations. This is some work I've done doing projection onto dancers, working with connects and calibrating projectors and connects together. So you can do this sort of like real time alignment of projection and body. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail. Um, in the last two years, I've kind of doubled back into machine learning because um, being involved in both machine learning at the same time as this creative coding, they were always like for me very, very separate. And then uh, in the last two years, I started noticing creative coders and new media people beginning to become more interested in AI and machine learning because we started to see things like this, sort of like neural nets hallucinating weird psychedelic images. And so for me, like that was really the first time I ever saw an intersection between these two. And so I started kind of like doubling down my efforts onto, you know, the, the new sort of wave of, of now this deep learning stuff. Um, and I'm going to take you through some projects. And of course, I mentioned this like, you know, this is, of course, what why everyone's here. Like deep learning has in has swallowed this process that used to exist of feature extraction. So if you're a computer vision researcher, you would work with bags of features that you take statistics on the image and then you plug that into some shallow learning uh, algorithm. And now that's all been turned on its head. We now do we can now work on the on the media directly, which means that a lot of the same methods uh, work on both audio and then on video and then images. And um, so it lets people who are interested in, in sort of cross media applications be uh, good at all of those things at the same time. So that's kind of been like very exciting for me. It's all been enabled by Covnets, of course. Um, Covnets are everywhere. I'm going to talk about some of these things. Um, of course, like I'm sure everyone's familiar with, with you know, self driving cars and speech to text and AlphaGo and, and you know, Deep Dream. All of this stuff has been enabled by Covnets in the last few years. And almost everything I'm going to show you are applications of Covnets. I also want to really quickly say before getting into my own work that uh, for me, like I've been very inspired by the community that's built up around this. So meeting meetups like this were really, really rare. Like uh, when I, you know, when I was getting into the field all the way back in ancient 2008, um, this kind of thing didn't really exist because it was a very academic topic. You know, if you were a, a researcher, you were probably coding in MATLAB, and you know you were working inside inside of university research facilities, and and so it felt like a really really hard field to break into. And now we have meetups and MOOCs, and we, you have researchers publishing all of their papers on open access peer review archive even before conferences came along. Uh, before the conferences, you have um, frameworks like you know TensorFlow and. Theano and Torch and now PyTorch and you know Keras and all these things that make it a lot easier to have a uniform environment which is open source and free and you know easy enough for anyone to get started with. So that's all like has really really made this big explosion of like public interest in in this field. And then of course you know for for discussion forums like Twitter and Reddit, um, all of that has been has enabled like a more public discourse of this kind of stuff to to continue. So that's been really inspiring for me. Um, I just mentioned Keras. Of course, you know, you're, how many people here use Keras? Good number. Okay. So, like, I, I've been, I've been, um, I'll show this later, but I've been making a lot of, like, uh, guides for artists to basically get started with Keras. And that's, um, you know, for, normally you would expect there would be a very steep learning curve, but artists can actually now begin to train their own convolutional neural networks because it's as easy as this. This is like 31 lines of Python code, which is very readable. And again, all of this is like very, very new. I think last couple of years. Um, so for me, like the the st what I mentioned when when the creative coding community took note notice of machine learning was when this happened. You guys remember this? <laughs> you remember this this guy? So this was an image that was posted to Reddit on the machine learning channel, and it was an image generated by a Covnet. And of course, it was Deep Dream, right? That was that was it was leaked actually. That's what I found out later um, by somebody at Google. And Deep Dream was released, and basically Google demonstrated this technique that had been sort of floating around in the research already, so it wasn't completely new. But the idea was that you take a neural network, you feed it an image, 
And then whatever it thinks it sees in that image, it takes the pixels and adjusts them so as to make itself see more of that thing that it thinks it's seeing, right? So like if it sees, you know, the camel bird or the dogfish or whatever, it'll adjust the pixels so as to see more of it. And so you could have a lot of fun with these. You could like, uh, because they also released the code, which was in cafe at that time. This was just two years ago, right? And um, so I started playing with this and I was just amazed like the results you'd get. This is just like my vacation photos, basically. Just throwing like the dogs, of course, the puppy slugs are all over the place and the capsules. I really like this one. This is a sketch by Leonardo da Vinci. So watch carefully, especially watch the steps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and the cool thing about Deep Dream, you have so much fun with it because you can choose which layers that you enhance, right? So the neural network sees features at multiple layers. And so you can be like, OK, I want to see features on the middle layers or the high layers. And um, you can kind of get some differences. But really, it has a very, it has a very, very specific aesthetic. Um, and, and a lot of it came from this guy, Mike Tycho, who's one of the original engineers and researchers who made it. And, and you can see that he kind of like, he took it to new levels, trained it on different data sets. He made lots of like, visuals that would deep dream starting with white noise just you know make random colored pixels and then you know the network's got to see something and so it would see this kind of stuff and so i started like riffing on his technique that he introduced this way of like you would you would deep dream an image and then you would crop it and then kind of you know zoom in that way and then deep dream it again and then crop it and then make this sort of endless fractal you know junk basically neural junk and this is just more deep dream junk. I want to keep moving. Um, yeah, so I got super tired of deep dream because it has like a very, very specific aesthetic. And it's pretty scary, like <laughs> seeing this in your coffee. Um, OK, so style transfer was the next technique that I that I played with a lot. So um, style transfer, you guys know, is, or how many people saw style transfer when that came out? Most people, right? So it's like this technique, very similar. At least the original one was very similar to deep dream. Uh, where you recompose one image in the style of another. And these were all made using like the first open source repository that I saw come out, which was um, Justin Johnson's Neural Styles, the torch-based um, torch based style transfer library that, that came out like literally days after their initial paper, which is really cool because you can now see like within a few days, a researcher who's proficient in one of these uh, toolkits can read a paper and then just implement whatever it was that was written by it totally, you know, independently of the original lab that came up with it. And so I was just blown away by like, you know, you throw in anything it's got and it'll it'll give you something that makes a lot of sense. Um, Liechtenstein, Kandinsky. I started throwing in like, you know, photos of not, not even paintings. So the Crab Nebula and Egyptian hieroglyphs and Google Maps. Um, started trying to make videos and videos initially it would just be one frame at a time right because and it's a very chaotic process right so like every time it kind of converges on different features but then a few months after this or now maybe like a half a year ago um, a team led by Manuel Ruder came up with this video style transfer technique where they would basically generate all the they would style transfer all of the frames of the original video at the same time um, and they had just an extra loss term which was this penalizing like excessive deviations in optical flow between the frames. And so this is like, this is by the way, this is a video I took from the J train of, of New York City is where I lived for about 12 years. And uh, just enveloped in, you know, the way, great wave of Kanagawa. And there's like, you know, I, I never get tired, of course, of Google Maps. <laughs> this is like my go to. <laughs> um, okay, so let me quickly show you a demo. I have a real time style transfer. Um, so you could do this basically real time um, using a slightly worse technique, or it's not as good like in terms of um, the performance. But like you'll notice, okay, so this is this is me in cubist style. This is you in cubist style. <laughs> and uh, if the keyboard doesn't flake out on me, I control it with the keyboard, but it's like doesn't respond sometimes. We'll kind of wait for it to respond while I talk about it. Um, so it's worth noting that I'm running this demo. Uh, entirely on this is like a four-year-old MacBook Pro so it's not even like uh, it's not exactly a top-of-the-line computer anymore and so you can actually do this like if you run actually just two days ago at the the um, graphics uh, what was it the GT who does? GTC yeah they had like a they had like a really good computer with four GPUs there we go 
um, Hokusai running this, and it's basically frame speed. It's frame rate level and HD. So you could do like a really, really good job. I have a few more of these styles. I'm going to put this online like t tomorrow, I hope, or in the next couple of days. I just have to find a place to host these mo models. Uh, but you get the idea, right? So like real-time style transfer. I'm going to get out of this demo. You can sign here. OK, let's go back into the slides. How am I doing on time? Not bad, like 12 minutes. 12 minutes. OK, cool. All right, so I won't. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'm going to kind of skip this part. So this is I actually really like this section, but I'm going to skip it. So basically, I'm just going to show you some work that I've done with generative models. So like you guys have maybe seen things like um, deep convolutional generative adversarial networks, which is like the best name for an algorithm ever, I think. And um, yeah, I'm going to skip this stuff. Um, you guys know eigenfaces? People know eigenfaces, right? Maybe. Um, this is kind of like a project from, I don't know where, when it's from. It's like it comes with all, like, usually when you're learning OpenCV, you kind of do eigenfaces. It basically demonstrates the idea of principal component analysis on images. And so that you can, the, the fewer of the principal components you keep, the more sort of like a dense space that you can sample from to reproject into original pixel space and get like sort of real looking faces. And of course, like principal component analysis isn't that good at this because it's flat, it's linear, it's a linear method. And so neural networks are way better at modeling, uh, like finding like that region of pixel space, which is gigantic, right? So if you have an image that has 200 pixels, that means you have 200 dimensions in your input space, in your image space, gigantic, but most of it is just empty noise. And so if you find a way of like locating where actual images lie, which you can with um, generative models like autoencoders and, and deep convolutional generative adversarial networks and all the all the varieties of GANs that we've seen. Um, you can do like you can do really great hallucinations of, of images. So this is like from the DC GAN paper by by these guys uh, about a year and a half ago, where they basically demonstrated a way of doing like arithmetic and generative space. Did you guys see? Have you guys seen this before? Okay, uh, I'll just describe this really briefly. Um, yeah, <laughs> well, it is what it is exactly what you see. So these are all, of course, synthetic faces that were <laughs> trained. This came from a training, trained on many images of faces, and um, you can you can generate faces and you can find the vec vectors in this latent space that produce different kinds of features that you want. So if you find the vector that produces a smiling woman, you can subtract the vector that produces a neutral woman, add the vector for neutral man. And of course, the woman man cancel, or sorry, the neutral neutral cancels out, and you get smiling man. So this is kind of like this is all academic papers, like being very serious, um, but actually demonstrating something really cool and making you know really really insane stuff like this. And so they they released their code online. Uh, it's the, the original DC GAN it was written in Theano. It's like a year and a half ago. Now there's DC GAN implementations in all of the packages, so TensorFlow and and Torch and so on. And you can, and so the first thing I tried with it was just using MNIST. So you could do these interpolations between image classes, like the different digits. And so you get like glyphs between characters that look kind of like digits, and you get a very smooth interpolation between actually, you know, perceivable digits. Um, I tried this on, don't have enough time to talk about this in detail, but um, I tried this on a data set of handwritten Chinese characters. I found this. Um, this is a data set that was being collected for optical character recognition. I thought I would use it for something else. And you see, like, on these pairs, the ones on the right are actually produced by the neural network and are, like, like pseudo-realistic looking. And you can then can, you can do this sort of, um, you know, like cruising this generative space and making different versions of the same characters um, that uh, of, of these real characters, but different versions of them. So I named this project. Uh, a book from the sky is named after a, a, an, an artwork by a Chinese artist named Xu Bing, who actually fabricated wood blocks of actual, or actually um, wood blocks of Chinese characters that he invented that weren't even real characters at all. A um, lot to it. There's a, I have a whole blog post about this. There's a lot, there's kind of a lot to dig into. I won't get into all the specifics. But you can see that it produces very nice interpolations between the characters. And you can train this on anything. So like other people trained it on manga characters and flowers and um, I don't I don't know what else probably lots of DC GAN projects that you can think of um, skip so I, I tried the arithmetic trick so like, this is really actually a joke 
Um, so, you know, like in, with word vectors, you have the classic king minus man plus woman equals queen. Um, so this is not actually the character for queen, unfortunately. So it did not converge <laughs> properly, but I thought it was kind of like, a, you know, worth a try. Um, okay, so this is some stuff by Deep Generator Networks. This is um, this is kind of like I think the maybe the pinnacle like so far of like photorealistic and large sampled images. Um, so like this is just uh, there's a TCN of all of them arranged by in a data set called CathayNet where they're arranged by similarity. So you see like there's a digital watch and a digital clock, and we go down here and there's a bunch of dogs, Lakeland Terrier, German Short-haired Pointer. Airedale, Pug, Norwegian Elkhound, lots of dogs, right? The birds, you know, um, gorillas, it's a primate section. <laughs> uh, different foods and, you know, different places and so on. You can actually, the way these work is that they have a, it's, it's like you have to simulate this network with a sort of, what they describe as an activation code, like an input code that will then for, feed forward through the network and then activate the part of the memory of the network which is responsible for creating some, for recognizing some class. And so this is the process of it finding the optimal input code to generate a picture of a macaw. All right, so there's the macaw sort of forming in this weird generative space. There it is. It's cute, isn't it? <laughs> um, and the one on the left over here is a teapot being made, and the one on the right is a cheeseburger. Yeah, so this is kind of like more fun with DGNs. It produces really weird looking people, like <laughs> so, conference center, legislative chamber. This looks like someone I can recognize. Yeah. I never even say who, and people always, always laugh. I really like the boathouses because you see reflections. So like the network learned, memorized the idea that water has, reflects things. Um, and so that was kind of a neat touch. Um, they're just doing all sorts of like amazing stuff, the, the, the guys over at this evolving AI. So they're now also generating images from captions. So you, 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 know, you go a red park, a red car parked on the side of the road and it'll generate an image for you, which has been trained to, uh, on the, yeah, which has been, um, which is sort of, sort of meant to resemble the caption in some sense. Um, okay, picks to picks. How many people saw picks to picks? Since I'm running close, I have four minutes. I'm going to skip this. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll just show you a few quick projects that I did with it. So this is just from a, like last week. So you train picks to picks so that it can take like um, a map of something and generate a texture from it. So like you, you, you could the classic example or the one that I, I used was you can train picks to picks to take maps and generate satellite imagery from it. So like a map is a symbolic representation of the satellite imagery. And so you can go from, you can train a network to translate one into the other. So this translates face tracker data, you know, face found, into the face of Donald Trump. And then I put myself in front of the camera, and um, it picks out my face, and then begins to hallucinate Donald Trump's face, basically. So here's my meat puppet, right? And you see how it's grotesque, right? And this is really cool because it operates, it's basically, once it's trained, it actually generates in real time. So I have, a, like, a webcam demo of this that I uh, used that at a workshop a couple weeks ago in Switzerland. So this is like people standing in front of the camera and making Trump caricatures. Um, some, a friend of mine released a very similar tool that does picks to picks in real time, and he trained it on a bunch of paintings and things like that. I'm going to skip that. Um, you guys saw us. <laughs> i got to skip this. <laughs> generating zebras from horses. Really, I'm sorry, I got to. Uh, <laughs> this speaks for itself, of course. Like, there's no even really. Okay, I just put this online today. This is like one of my last things. Um, you guys know FaceApp? Has anyone seen FaceApp? So you know, like it basically puts a smile on you, or it makes you a female, or it makes you look old. So I thought it'd be really funny to just reapply the uh, smiling filter until it couldn't detect the face anymore. <laughs> it's horrible, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so a bunch of demos. Unfortunately, I have to. Not, I have to skip these. Um, oh, what's this? Oh, oops. Yeah. Hang on a second. Um, I just want to go into my last section. I have three minutes. Okay. So I just want to show you, I've been building a lot of tools on uh, having a lot of demos and tools and things that I built for artists to use. It's on the website called ml4a.github.io, which you'll see in a second. These are just different things that have been made with it. Um, I, this, you can train 
your own cubnets to basically control appliances. Um, this is, uh, <laughs> I wish I could show this. I'll show that, I'll send, send links to you guys later. Um, but um, different like tools that you can use. Okay, hang on a second. Let me. So that's Bohemian Rhapsody, and it's been clustered on the TC according to sonic similarity. So these are all tools that work that can you can um, kind of use in real time. Of course, my YOLO. So this is like real time object detection. So there's a bunch of persons in the audience usually. I saw European inhabitant <laughs> leader. Yeah, it's a lot of a lot of funny things. Um, you can you can do this on your screen, and so on. Skype is this another fun thing you could do? Um, way yeah, way too many things to show you. You can do it to Deep Dream, of course. Like. <laughs> Um, okay, so this is the website I was just referring to. So if you're interested in any of the tools, any of the code samples, there's a lot of resources that I've made available along with some collaborators to help you get started with this topic. Um, and it's called mlforay.github.io. And I've had lots of workshops. I've had something like, I think, close to 30 in the last year, including um, one just a few days ago, actually a number just a few days ago. And um, all of these materials have been made uh, for the workshops and have been sort of used to get people started pretty quickly. And um, that's all. So I'm this is my website. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and mlfray.github.io. Please do check it out and stay in touch if you're interested in the subject. Um, and that's all. So thank you. Cool. Thanks so much, Gene. And I think you're always looking for collaborators, yes, right? At mlforay.github.io. Exactly. Um, it's awesome teaching materials as well for students who want to get started. Um, of course, Gene is way too polite, so he's writing a book as well, together with another person, Francis. That's right. Uh, yeah. And you're also looking for collaborators. Yeah, right? yeah. The whole thing is um, basically it's a we right now it's kind of like mostly been oriented towards these workshops that we've held, but it's try we're trying to grow it into like a, something of a collaborative platform where people can basically who want to teach each other how to make interesting creative things with machine learning. Um, that's an outlet to do so to share your knowledge and so on. So it's think of it as a platform and please do yeah if you're interested in using it or or collab or contributing to it, please do let me know. And you will be here for a while. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. yeah I'll be here I'll be hanging out. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, Thank you so much Jin. Yeah. Um, so next up is also uh, someone I admire also a lot. Um, so someone who not necessarily sort of seen as playing around with AI, but actually is um, with generative system, music systems, uh, and specifically on the front end side. So someone who doesn't necessarily build a lot of the AI models, but actually plays around with them uh, and also plays around more with kinds of systems, which in a way, even with uh, deep learning being more and more of a hype, I would say systems are still AI and very interesting. So here he is, Daryl, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Antero from, from Helsinki and from Creative AI. And uh, so I want to talk. Do you need a microphone? Do I need a microphone? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, what was that? A yes or a no? <laughs> it's okay. All right. I can use one though. Let's see. Better? Okay. No? <laughs> Augment me, please. Hello. Well, I'll just try to speak loudly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I want to talk about creative augmentation, which was the thing that just failed there, I think. And um, so this is the kind of big cybernetic idea of using technology to augment your human capabilities, which is something we talk about a lot in the context of AI and all these new tools that we are building. But that has actually been going on for much longer than that, arguably, as long as there has been technology. So, so what I want to do is take a few examples from experimental musicians and them 
using technology to augment their capabilities actually since the 1960s. And uh, so as I mentioned, the big idea here is, is the cybernetic one of you as a musician or just in general as a human being, putting yourself into this situation where you're making something together with a machine. It's not just you who is coming out with a musical output and not just the machine, but it's actually the the system you form together with the machine and the feedback that loop between you two. And uh, there's, I think, a couple of big reasons why you would want to do something like this as a musician. One of them is that you get to augment your nervous system uh, with technology. So if you are someone like me, for example, who hasn't been playing the piano, say, since you were five for 20 or 30 years and haven't been conditioning your nervous system to play the piano keyboard, it's highly unlikely that you will ever, ever be a piano, a piano virtuoso, right? Because it's just too late for that. But with the right kind of technology, you can easily think of, think of a way to make music that's every bit as, as uh, dexter, dex, dexterous as uh, a virtuoso would do. And while it's up there, you can actually make music that no human is physically able to perform with technology. But the second reason, I think, which is even more interesting to me is that you get to augment your imagination with technology. So for example, by putting some sort of generative system as part of your process, you get to make music that your brain would not actually even be able to come up with in the moment. You can expand the kind of creative space in which you can work in uh, by using technology that comes out with things that you would not come up with by yourself. And I think these are very good reasons to use sort of creative augmentation. And, and there are many examples of musicians doing exactly this uh, throughout the years. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, three of them in particular. And for my first one, I'm going to go all the way back to, to the early 1960s, to the so-called post-war generation of, of experimental musicians who were working with a lot, lot of different kinds of technologies to, to augment themselves. And one of the patterns that came up at that time was this thing called the time lag accumulator. This was actually used by many, many musicians, but the name to it was given uh, by Terry Riley. And uh, it was based on the most sort of important technology of the time, which was magnetic tape. Like, this is probably the most important invention for, for music in general, but uh, certainly experimental music of the 20th century. And um, with time like accumulation, you used magnetic tape in a certain way, which was to take a tape recorder, feed into it your, your audio input. So you would play guitar, a synthesizer, anything you would want to play and feed it into the system. But then what you would do is you, you would put another tape recorder next to the first one. And you would feed the tape from one recorder to the next one. And in the first recorder, you would play, uh, you would record the audio and in the second one, you would play it back immediately. And from the second recorder, then also feed the audio output back in as input to the first one. So you would make this kind of feedback loop out of tape recorders that you had lying around, which would repeat everything you played over and over and over again, which would actually enable you to augment yourself with the version of yourself from five seconds ago, or however long it took for the tape to travel between these two machines. So it was that kind of augmentation where you actually played a duet with yourself in semi-real time. And there was a lot of actually interesting experimental music that was made with exactly this kind of setup. So that's time like accumulation. A lot of augmentative 
um, mileage from a couple of tape recorders, basically. So you don't need actually that much always to, to be able to do things. But for my second example, I'm going to then move ahead a couple of decades, actually, to a time in the 80s when the hottest technology was no longer really tape recorders, but the personal computer. Because computers were becoming everyday objects at that time and also becoming available to, to musicians in general. And there was, in the 80s, the succession of, of software programs that were collectively called intelligent instruments, which were all about building musical instruments using software for the personal computer that would then use the computing power of the, of the machines to do things that you could not do with mechanical instruments. And here I want to highlight especially the work of, of Laurie Spiegel, who was one of the, or is one of the pioneers of this space in general. Uh, she worked at Bell Labs in the 70s and 80s, where well, a lot of the innovations of the 20th century were made, but also musical innovations around digital synthesis and, and use of computers in, in music and, and, and things like that. And she had this epiphany when she was there that you could actually use uh, logic embedded in the computer and its ability to learn and to simulate aspects of our own human intelligence, which is a very kind of AI kind of thought, uh, to let the computer grow into an actively participating extension of a musical person, which I think is kind of the, the whole idea of creative augmentation right there in this quote from Lawrence Spiegel from the 1980s. And the kind of manifestation of her ideas at that time was strongest in this software that she wrote and that came out in 86 called Music Mouse which was available for Atari ST and, and Amiga computers. And I think it actually shipped with some Amigas at some point. So some of you may have seen that, that if you had Amigas at home. But this was a program that actually married a couple of, of big ideas. One was to repurpose the use of the computer mouse, the Engelbart creation, to actually make melodies. So you would push around the mouse to make melodic shapes. And the other one was to use the computer than to augment those melodies. So the program would, would add harmonies on top of those melodies and then also add rhythmic uh, augmentation on top of that. And, and music mode is actually something I can show you right now because I have it right here. So this, this is not the original music mouse. This is a version of it for the web browser that, that I have made and which is not out yet, but will hopefully be soon. But it's generally a very, tries to be a very faithful reproduction of the original. So you'll get the idea of what this means. So what I'm about to do is just move the mouse or actually my finger on the track back, trackpad around a little bit. So what I'm doing is essentially improvising on the C major scale, but I'm not using any particular skill to do it because I don't have any. I'm just, you know, wiggling my finger essentially, but the software is augmenting me, letting me kind of hit the right keys so to speak and also stay in some kind of rhythm here and i can start to actually make things also more interesting by adding some randomized broken chords slow things down a little bit as well uh, make some more open articulation and then i'll just put out one of these patterns here so now I'm actually not doing anything anymore. The software is playing itself, which kind of lets me now as the human side of this computer human system to think on a higher level, more strategically, how do I actually want this piece to sound like this? Because the computer now takes care of the details. I can start thinking like, well, maybe I want to add some more bass here to move things lower in the scale. maybe switch keys from time to time. Or maybe transpose a little bit. So things like that. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially playing piano music which I could not play if you put me in front of a piano keyboard. I can't play piano like that. But using software, I can do that. I can make music that I actually want to listen to with this technology from 86, uh, which essentially augments me to let me kind of do things I could not do without software. 
and that's intelligent instruments. So then for my final example, I'm going to again jump ahead quite a bit to actually the present day, to this project that came out earlier this year called the AI Duet, which was a project by, by Yota Man and, and some people at Google, which is another uh, piano-based intelligent instrument, actually, just like the music mouse. But this time it's, it's backed by this recurrent neural network. Um, how many of you have actually seen this project? A few people. Okay, so I'll show you that as well. But the idea here is, is that I have another kind of web-based thing here where I have a piano keyboard, which lets me play things into it. But what it will then do is it will use the neural network built into it to respond to the things that I play with something else. So I can enter a phrase here by playing this on my keyboard. And then it will respond. with something. And uh, so it's kind of actually also like time-like accumulation in that it's, it's a similar system where I play something and the system then responds with something. And But the difference then is that it's highly unpredictable to me, like what it's going to come out with, because it's a neural network and no one understands what they do. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and there's so much complexity in this thing. And that kind of leads me to my final point, which is that these things sort of fall into this continuum of when you as a musician play them, how much can you predict what they're going to do? So something like time like accumulator, it's highly predictable because it's this mechanism that just repeats what you play. And the combinations that you come out with might be surprising, but the mechanism itself is you can understand it. Music must also is something you can kind of learn to play. You can learn the rules that are built into it and kind of master that instrument. And then you can kind of play it and control the output. AI do it not so much. You can't really know what it's going to do. So on the one hand, this is sort of going into this direction of that there's more of this augmentation of the imagination that I talked about earlier, where by definition, it's coming out with things that you did not think of. But at some point, there is a line here that you cross where it stops probably feeling like augmentation, where it doesn't feel like it's actually amplifying you, and instead, instead adding something separate to the process, which is, I think, AI duet starts to be, feel, like, feel more like that, more like that where you don't feel like you're actually playing the music. It's, you're playing some of it, but then someone else or something else, another agent, is playing that other part of it. And well, this is, I think, some, a question or a consideration that anyone who's doing one of these systems needs to address. Like, where is your project in this continuum and where do you want it to be? And where do musicians that you are making this to, if it's yourself or someone else, where do you want this to be? Do you want to kind of control the output? How much do you want to be surprised? And how much do you kind of want to be the only agent that's making the music? And, and what it actually means to be augmentative rather than this, that, than uh, having some, some, someone else, something else in that process. And that's actually the question I, I want to leave you with. And uh, by that, I thank you. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, Full disclosure, yes, Tara and I work together, so just that's clear. Ah, we have already some questions, yeah. I hope now if you uh, know projects that are combined style, actual music. I think I've seen some, yeah. I think there are others here who might know better than me. There's some, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's an active field of research. So, so there's some researchers who will, I think, soon publish it. It's kind of, it's a golden nugget where there's a few groups working on it and trying to kind of make it ready for publication. There was uh, one nice attempt by Dimitri Ulyanov. Yeah. You look up that one where he got, did like a, took the, what was it, like the Star Spangled Banner and he made it sound like Darth Vader or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. If you um, look up Dimitri Ulyanov's audio style transfer, he's got a, something online. I mean, style transfer is a kind of technique close to the true, like how the images work. There are some filled attempts. But style transfer as a technique, how do I transfer a certain genre of music towards another genre? There is actually much older and also newer attempts, and it's quite a big field, and yeah, there's a lot to come. 
Let's follow up this question. Does anyone try it with a real uh, club environment, for example, in the nightclubs or the places mm -hmm. where you have, used to have regular people or regular DJ and people used to like different sorts of music? So if you consider like first and second speakers, mm -hmm. things like uh, how people behaving in the club and take a picture and then also checking what kinds of music they like or how what is their feelings mm -hmm. and combine together and then DJ will do nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, from real life, I don't know any. I was just reading the, reading the new Cory Doctorow book, though, where it was actually a system exactly like that. But that was in fiction. So, but that means it will be true probably very soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and having this kind of idea where everyone has their personalized clubbing experience based on what they like and they might not even hear the same things is an interesting one. Usually, biggest clubs, for example, they always prefer like what maximum people are liking and do the check is what is the feelings people, and they just play yeah. the music what they did last one week or one month. So it's actually really, really around their following simply. Right. Yeah. So DJs they are mostly like giving entertainment for for the rest of the masses, not like for the music. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the next step will be to actually make that personalized, which is already happening online, right? Where we have our own reality on Facebook, for example. They might have that in clubs as well. Cool. Um, so Terry will also stay around. Then it's time for a, so a break. We'll have a 15 minutes break with, uh, I think there's some drinks and there's some pizza getting cold. Um, and then uh, after that, we'll go uh, towards uh, Luba. To test it, just to yeah. make sure that I've used it before, but it's exactly the same. Okay, okay, um, just for my peace of mind. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hello, world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I see, I think it should be fine. Um, <laughs> ah, live stream. <laughs> <laughs> Subject from your laptop, right? Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. 
Can you add the projector as a display? Yeah. Seems to not like. Yeah, and just drag, uh, drag the presentation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Strange. People have used it before. Can you can you take this? Uh, what you could do is just use someone else's laptop. Let's see, just fix. Okay. Okay. Um, Carol. Carol. That's why I always put up a break in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Good timing. I will get you the Don't you worry. I don't think it's Should I get for you too? Do you want me to get for you too, Victor? Yep. You're copying me? Oh, I just don't. I, I, I need to copy it as well. It's a little bit easier or better that way. Yeah, because I, I will need the USB port for the uh, right. Yeah, I can't really use PowerPoint, but I think you can. So. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Perfect. Uh, the only instruction is to drop it in this direction a little bit. Is, is it all right if I'm on the other side? Because I don't want to hide yeah, yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the instruction, there is also a good representation. Thank you. Uh, so uh, OK, yeah, so yeah. Well, that's, 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 that's PowerPoint as well? That's PowerPoint. Right now, 
Tror jag hittar på att jag tar det. Jag tror att jag har That's nice. It's a little bit better. I think I'll just plug this in because it's going to be here a while. Yeah. In some. So, for the power. have you thought about uh, I have actually, yeah. I was going to do it first with just you know Markov chains to see how it would, how you could train it live and then play it back in your style. But I haven't tried it yet. It feels like <laughs> yes, it would be. The thing about music mouse is that I. I have to ask Laurie Spiegel if she would be happy with that because it's hers, her creation, and I don't want to kind of do shit that she doesn't want to do with it. Have you talked to her? Yeah, yeah. Before I started, I asked for her permission to do this. And I'm going to write actually some tutorials for JavaScript people who want to do instruments around this. Well, what is she doing? She, she does, she's composing music. 
really experimental music in open space. And she was just like, she had a new piece on the Moog Fest in, in New York. So, she, she, I don't think she's programming much, but she's doing music. Well, I think I don't see why she wouldn't be interested in this. Yeah, I, I think she might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely because I, and also in general I think she was happy to get this program because it's not available for anything that you can yeah. no one has an Atari or an Amiga yeah. or a Mac OS nine, which is none of these available of course. No one can use it. I was thinking that you should totally you should totally feedback into mm. music mouse what it created so it could change the parameters of music mouse. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That would yeah. be really cool to actually. And also, you know, let's then put it in our system and make it a block. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. Uh, really interesting stuff. That's I expect that's how things will work. In yeah. The future. Uh, yeah. If we standardize the inputs and the outputs, that's how yeah, it yeah, that should work. Yeah. But, but, but also, kind of, what's interesting to me about that is that it's really simple. There's a couple of yeah. random numbers and a couple of algorithms that are deterministic. But when you put them together, it generates a variety. And how little you actually need to do something like that. It's very simple. That's my point. I'm making uh, later uh, in my presentation is that we have to have a bottom up, a thumb, a thumb, a thumb down approach. Right. Because yeah. there is so much knowledge in the culture. Right. But we don't expect uh, um, to kind of go. Networks, their yeah. networks to reinvent everything. Yeah, so yeah, we yeah. have to feed them from both directions. Yeah, not go. Yes, this tech, please. No. Take this tech, use it. Yeah, yeah. And, and and like when she wrote Music Mouth, mm -hmm. she understood what a chord was, she understood right. the parameters that, that, yeah. that could be changed meaningfully. Right. Uh, and we don't have to train uh, uh, some machine learning algorithm mm -hmm. uh, on all the corpus of music to try to rediscover exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. exists already. That's that's yeah. That's that's the sort of thing that artists would also seem to be very interested in. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah that, that was the project for her own musical expression. Mm. Yeah. No, that's exactly that. It's coming from the artist yeah. uh, and, and and doing something that is generative, but, but with the rules of an artist instead with the rules of, her, her instead own of own, yeah. with the rules of a programmer. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's rules, that, rules that define the aesthetic space that you yeah, yeah, exactly. get into. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, because, well, we've spent basically millennia trying to come up with it. Right. right. So, yeah. We're not there yet. Uh, well, we, we, have, we have a lot of these rules already, mm -hmm. uh, so, so we can start with that. And, yeah. and when we were talking about finding the uh, the spaces where you break the rules or where you find the rules. Mm -hmm. Well, it helps if you already have all the rules that we know about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's understanding the rules first, and then yeah. you know, it's, it's one of those things that, that is hard when you're coming out from ex outside of that world. So that. we have to work with people who know, yeah. or we have to use the research that, that artists uh, have done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The yeah. yeah, that's why artists like Laurie Spiegel are, are very nice because she's also written a lot about her processes and her ideas about how these things should be done and also technical things like musical set theory and things like that. So yeah. you can learn. I, I know. Nothing, but music, mm -hmm. absolutely nothing. It's one of my just regrets. Uh, I realized that, yeah, okay, it was not about learning instruments. I could have learned music. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I've, I've learned in other domains, like mm -hmm. I've learned architecture, and it's just something like Right. And, and, uh, in general design mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So, but, but if we can start developing tools that will integrate those rules and then working with yeah. artists that have this deep knowledge yeah. of uh, have a deep understanding of what their art is mm -hmm. would allow us to put the back into the yeah. process. Yeah, those are kind of exist in all different artistic domains right? 
and kind of with the, with the same skills or same kind of understanding about the pattern nature of it. And work with musicians or visual artists or, yeah. or architects. Yeah. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Is this in experimental music? I think there are some connections actually between architecture. Yes, the Corbusier would work with Zanakis, right? With this, uh, Ian is Zanakis, but was the composer, Greek composer, who did uh, data driven compositions in the 60s. I think. He was, Zanakis was also an architect, and one of them was the teacher of the other. I think really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, and then I think Zanakis started to think of this in a kind of pattern oriented way as well. Oh, and if you can find references to, to, to this, I've heard, yeah, yeah, I've heard yeah. African wrote a, a novel. Uh, <laughs> okay. I need to remind myself where I read about that. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, the, the connection between architecture and music uh, to me uh, is a uh, pity of the architects. Yeah. Uh, which is, Horrible movie, but beautiful movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Music is highly technical and highly, highly kind of <laughs> computation as well. Yeah. Just, just like a lot of architecture as well. Yeah. Interesting. Meeting points here. <laughs> All the pizza are gone. Sometimes it's like the pathfinding, because it's the portal. Back. 
from the same portal, and it goes back and forth, and you can't find it, and it just loops forever. Something like that. So just the game is totally fun. Great. Why not? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not? You should know. You should know better. <laughs> they don't actually do You, you can use this if you want. Maybe I'll get to the one. Okay. Okay. Uh, some kind of structuring of this space. Uh, yeah, we're trying to understand where it can go. Yeah. From what I understand, we'll be talking a little bit about the same Hello, everyone. We're going to get started again. Abba. <laughs> Then you, you, you copyright infringement if you put that on the screen. I'm, oh. I'm going to play ABBA until people are here. <laughs> Not sure if it's working? No. <laughs> Yeah. Huh? 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 So we're going to get started again. Not sure if, if that ABBA worked as a rallying cry. <laughs> yes. Haha. <laughs> so, um, cool. So we're getting started again. And uh, before I, um, before we uh, go into really interesting stuff by Luba. Um, there were a lot of questions. Where can I find more stuff on creativity and AI? So this is a, a project where we're running a Reddit style type community, creativeai.net. So check it out. We're basically just anyone is welcome to post stuff here. You find somewhere uh, on the topic you think it's interesting to share. Um, there's a newsletter as well which shares this twice a week. Uh, so that's that. And then if you're on the research site and you want to code and, and play around with these things yourself. Um, then there's also GitKaif, so it's research papers with implementations of code. Um, so if you are doing research, please publish your code, otherwise it's not science, just to be reproducible. Um, preferably also the data, um, but anyway, code and research is here. And then the third piece is if you're interested more in the history of creative AI and as a field, some ideas of some people where it comes from, there is also this blog post, um, creative AI slash creative AI something on Medium. Um, and it's long and it has like a lot of animated GIFs, so don't open it on your mobile. And that's it. Then we go to uh, Luba, who will actually go into much more detail 
uh, on what is going on with creativity and, and AI. So, Ooh. thank you. Oh, so can we have, oh, the microphone actually works. Perfect. Hi, so I'm Luba, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about where I come from, and then I will tell you about uh, yeah what's happening in terms of startups and corporate initiatives in this uh, creative AI field. So one of the things I do is uh, I run a meetup on uh, creative AI in London, and uh, I do two things there. So. One is I invite researchers from companies and labs such as DeepMind, Imperial, Bell Labs to present their research and this way inspire creatives to make use of these latest trends and technologies to come up with uh, cool projects. And the second thing is I invite some of those creatives to talk about the artworks they've done and, uh, and various other projects. So yeah, it's uh, it's a meetup that happens on a monthly basis, and I started it in September. It's uh, it's been quite popular. Uh, I also try to keep in touch with uh, with the art side. So I regularly review art and new media exhibitions and conferences, and I try to be active on Instagram so that I can still get an understanding of what the contemporary art community is uh, is looking for and values. Because that is really important if you're looking at some um, artwork that is created with AI. Because, of course, the two communities don't necessarily always have the same view on what is art. But I think Jean covered the art side, so I'm going to talk more about the, the business side. Oh, yeah. But I do want to mention the, the one artwork I did do. Because uh, maybe, maybe in some ways it is relevant to to uh, to add to the discussion so there was a conference in berlin called retune at the end of uh, october or in the beginning of october last year and i wanted to go to it but i kind of didn't want to pay for a ticket and um they had an open call so i thought okay what can i you know uh, sell them so i thought i'm gonna sell them this idea of uh, a play called the turing test and uh, the way this play was going to work was I was going to have two texts, one written by a recurrent neural network and one by a human. And then I was going to find volunteers who would then act out those texts, acting either as uh, humans or as robots, according to their interpretation of these terms. And then I'd get the audience to judge who had which combination. So who was acting the recurrent neural network written text as a human who was doing it as a robot and uh, the other way around. So this way I've kind of outsourced, you know, pretty much everything. The writing of the text, the acting of the text and the judging of the text. And I thought it was, uh, you know, quite cool. I, and it got accepted and, I, and I've performed it uh, at Reaching and then also at a couple of uh, events in, in the UK. But in some ways, I, I always feel nervous or kind of not comfortable with calling myself an artist in a way, because even though I did come up with the concept, which could mean that I can claim the, I suppose, the term artist. In some ways, given that I've outsourced pretty much everything in this to either machines or to other humans, it's, uh, it feels weird. But anyway, I'll, I'll just, I thought I'd just mention that for the purposes of the panel discussion, which we'll have later with Ruby and some others. Yeah, I, I also do some research on the business side, and this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my presentation. So when Ralph invited me to come and give a talk, I was thinking, like, what should I talk about? Should I talk about art and AI? Because that is a very big interest of mine. Or should I talk about this kind of the more business uh, side? And then Ralph checked with, uh, with, I think, some venture capitalists and told me that they're not coming to give a talk. So maybe I should you know, do that instead. So I guess I'm kind of the resident representative of the venture capital side on this, uh, on this panel. Um, yeah, so in terms of this uh, research looking at uh, creative AI startups and initiatives, 
it started off with um, with an article that I wrote with uh, a venture capitalist called Peter Jagan, who works at uh, Flint Capital in London. And um, yeah, as you can see, when you submit a guest post to to um, to a website or a, or an online newspaper such as VentureBeat, you get uh, delightful images that have nothing to do with the topic you're covering. So yeah, the article was on creative AI, particularly looking at the opportunities that exist beyond VR and gaming. And of course, we have some sort of uh, human robot with his uh, head being blown out. But that's how journalism works these days, maybe. And yes, so as I am representing the venture capital perspective, I have to have some graphics which uh, preferably go up and show that uh, you know a lot of money is being invested into the sector. So you can see that investment in AI increased pretty much 10 times between 2012 and 2016. And, um, and yeah, in terms of VR investments, there's also quite a steep increase with uh, $1.8 billion invested in AR and VR in 2016. So it's quite a lot of money. And uh, yeah, so we decided to write uh, an article looking at uh, creative AI, and we were looking for a good definition to, to take to encompass this field because ultimately a lot of things can be considered creative. And um, what uh, Peter Jagan and I did in the end, we went to um, to a report published by the Department for Culture, Media, and Sport. So it's one of the government organizations in, in the UK looking at the creative industries. And so it's ultimately a field where the workforce possesses creative skills required to yield either novel or significantly enhanced products whose final form is not fully specified in advance. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what they decided is creative. And in terms of uh, the numbers, the, the report uh, by this uh, DCMS institution, government institution, found that the cultural and creative industries grew 1.4 times faster than the UK economy between 1997 and uh, 2014, which is uh, quite impressive if you think about it, because we did have we did have well at least one recession that I remember and maybe maybe some others. And uh, in terms of the value generated in uh, 2014, it was over 84 billion of gross value that was added. And that's just in the UK alone. So if you think about it on a global scale, of course, uh, it's even better. And so what are the cultural and creative industries? So this is a classification from, again, this DCMS institution. Um, and, the, and this graphic shows the growth from 2008 to 2014, and uh, I guess also the, the size of, of the sector. And uh, so it's, the sectors include IT, software and computer services, advertising and marketing, film, TV, video, radio and photography, publishing, music, performing and visual arts, architecture, design and crafts. So there's one other sector that they didn't mention, and uh, that is the museums, galleries, and libraries. So maybe they found that the sector didn't grow so much, or <laughs> maybe you know they considered it uh, a little insignificant. So, so yeah, that's that's what was in the report. Sorry, just to see, like the red color means that those sectors are decreasing, and the blue ones are increasing. Yes. So what is the blue one on top of the sign? What is the, the the blue one on top of top of the sign? So, so that is that is part of the. You mean this one, right? Uh, one, the one that is growing the most. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I was actually also curious about that, and so I looked this up. So this is part of the music performing and visual arts categories, and it's actually the administrative and support services to the arts. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah, creatives also need to make money somehow, so if it's also through the bureaucratic side, maybe it isn't, it isn't the worst outcome. 
I don't know. Yeah, so this is uh, this is kind of the the landscape we did with uh, with Peter Jagan, and uh, we decided. So, so, so we looked at 94 example creative AI startups and corporate initiatives. So I can say that certainly not all startups or projects you will have heard of are on this map. New ones keep appearing every day, as it seems, because you know there is so much interest in AI and creative things are always cool. But um, yeah, this this is the list we came up with uh, in our research and felt was reasonably representative of what was happening. So in terms of the industries we looked at, we based the research on the classification I just showed you, but we grouped it a little bit. So to music, performing and visual arts, design, anything from product, graphic to fashion, architecture and crafts, and then film, TV, video, radio, photography, followed by advertising and marketing, IT software and computer services, and museums, galleries and libraries. And in terms of the startups present in, in those fields, we group them into four main groups. So one is search and discovery. So various kind of recommendation engines and tools that help you uh, find new things. Then the second one is personalization. So looking at the tools that help you tweak your product without changing its essence. Then there are some tools that, um, that, that provide you with uh, feedback in real time to whatever you're doing or enable you to interact with, um, with the product. And then finally is the creative process augmentation slash automation, which is a lot, of, uh, a lot of cool things that actually play a key role in, in the product itself. And uh, as you can see, there is that there are some categories that are quite well represented. Mainly, I think the recommendation systems that uh, you know have taken off ever since kind of Netflix and uh, you know Spotify, and you know they're even used in uh, in museums and art galleries, particularly on the commercial side when uh, people are you know looking to match what um, what you might be looking for uh, artwork wise. And in terms of personalization, we found that, you know, there are some example companies, but uh, it isn't perhaps something that is as well represented or as interesting to entrepreneurs to tackle as this uh, creative process, uh, um, augmentation automation side. So there are a lot of uh, music startups over there, such as Juke Deck, um, Amber Music, Mobirds, um, flow machines. So there are corporate initiative from uh, Sony CSL Music in Paris, and um, and there are also startups that look at the well that, that look at let's say the style transfer angle, such as Prisma and um, Somatic Labs. And yeah, there are still some empty um, empty empty spaces left, and the reason for these empty spaces left could be you know, partly because the, the sector could be museums, galleries, and libraries, which are often publicly funded and don't have so much money for experimentation, particularly in the categories that are probably more for fun rather than something that can have a direct uh, impact on the final revenue relatively quickly, which you could say is the case of the recommendation engines. And yeah, so that was um, that was the graphic. And then uh, yeah, I have I have a couple of example uh, startups. So yeah, the search and discovery that I mentioned. So there's this uh, search engine called uh, Yasarian that uh, helps you to kind of th that helps you to broaden your outlook of uh, the same beauty. So if you Google beauty you could end up with uh, photos of lots of pretty girls wearing a lot of makeup with beautiful flowing hair. But if you use this uh, search engine, then you can get some diamonds, flowers, design, um, family, precision, nature images. 
So, you know, if you kind of broaden the, def the definition of that term, that could uh, come up with uh, various diverse and unexpected concepts that share some loose associations and therefore help you come up with the cool ideas yourself. And then uh, there's this project from ArtFinder called Emma the AI Curator. And uh, I quite like this one. So there's this Twitter bot. And if you tweet at ArtFinder Emma with, with an image that you want to have, that you want to find an, an, an artwork that is, that is close to it. So for example, there was this, um, this floral art painter who wanted to find an artist or a photographer who was uh, also producing work in a similar style to her own. So she tweeted at ArtFinder Emma and uh, this is what the bot slash the curator came up with. And uh, I do actually quite see the similarity in terms of the color and I guess the subject matter to an extent. So yeah, you, you can try that if you're looking for some art and you want to, and you have some ideas what you want it to look like. And then in terms of personalization tools, there's, uh, there's, there's this startup called Aito Kaiku, quite a complicated name, but um, I found it quite interesting because uh, what they do is they enable you to, so, so, so they use sensors to change the way music is played. So let's say the same track is played differently depending on uh, your mood, how loud it is in the place. So there are a variety of uh, factors that that are considered for this. So I think this this is already available kind of uh, on the app store and you can play around with it. And um, I met with the founders on Monday and soon they will have this cool update that if you kind of move your phone and, and scan a room with it, they'll have some music playing depending on kind of the, the content and the faces of the people in the room. In terms of interaction and feedback, there's this Moji startup that uh, enables you to use this object thing they have to transform any um, any object into a musical instrument. There's also this startup called Ink Hunter. If you want to try try what a tattoo would look like on you without actually getting it first, which which is I think quite sensible. <laughs> <laughs> so. There's that one. And then in terms of uh, creative process augmentation slash automation, I still can't figure out w which is the right word for this. But um, in terms of augmentation or the, or, or the automation. But um, anyway, the startups that we have in this field uh, include Juke Deck, which, uh, which is a startup that generates uh, professional quality music. And you get to input what uh, kind of genre you want, what kind of mood you like, and also how long. So this is kind, this is quite useful if, uh, let's say you want some background music for your latest blogging video or something, and you don't quite want to pay a professional composer to do it for you. And then there's also these guys, but I think, I'm not quite sure exactly what they do, <laughs> but... <laughs> But I'm sure they'll be able to tell you how exactly they fit into this uh, into this uh, landscape. And I think with that, um, do you want to actually do that now? No. People come and talk to us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, yeah. No, no. No, you won't. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I was just going to finish anyway. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening. If you have kind of any questions or any thoughts, this is my email and this is my Twitter. And now uh, I'll pass back to Roll. Yeah. Great. Um, so for the plan, we have our final presentation by Stefan. And then after that, we'll probably don't do a break, and then we'll have a short roundtable for who still uh, wants to uh, hang in here and is still up for that. Um, just close that one.
So there we go. Give it up for Stefan. I'll try without it and down here. If it works. It seems like everything is coming from many different directions and, and you can't see patterns out of uh, all this creativity. And I couldn't either. So I made a presentation uh, so I could make sense uh, of all of it. Um, and, and while doing so, and, and also because uh, I, I'm very passionate about it, uh, I, I felt like we are at the beginning of uh, incredible collaboration between AI uh, and, uh, and, and creativity and creative people, uh, and that we have to be very optimistic about it. And that's what I, uh, I'm going to try to do during this presentation, map the space uh, and, and tell you why, why it's cool. Um, and this space is really big, and we've only explored a small portion of it. So I, if I have only one mission here is to give you a sense of this, the, the size of this space and how we can go about uh, exploring it. Uh, um, this, this is the Uber, Uber deep field, and this is the number of uh, copies of the Uber deep field that you need to fill the sky, 30 million. Um, so what I'm going to do is take an arbitrary uh, set of dimensions to map this space, two that relate to AI and two that relate to creativity. Um, so computational, how AIs work, relational, relational, how AI and humans interact, uh, the steps of the creative process and how these connect, and uh, the levels of uh, abstraction that uh, all these problems uh, deal with. Uh, so let's start with uh, computational. Uh, basically, this is, this is AI. Uh, the, the, the whole history of AI is how to get more mileage out of this. Uh, and um, you have a world state and you have a condition, and if this condition in this full state uh, is fulfilled, you take an action. And, and from the beginning, we, we start very low, and we're, we're trying to get more uh, productivity uh, out of this. Uh, in in uh, a language that speaks to uh, programmers, you have some data, a, a data set, uh, you find patterns in this, uh, in this data, and you have a process uh, that, that says what you should do in this condition. For instance, um, uh, we started with expert systems and, and uh, the data is okay, you have a car and it doesn't work. And uh, the, the condition, the pattern is uh, the oil uh, indicator is on and there is this clumping noise uh, that you hear. And the process is okay, maybe you should check if you have a leak. Uh, and throughout the history of AI, uh, this got more and more complex, uh, having blackboards that are able to structure patterns uh, to, to, to operate on the same data set, having uh, hierarchical state machines that are able to um, simulate context by having patterns inside of patterns, uh, planners that treat patterns as data so that they can operate on patterns and, and find um, uh, consistencies and inconsistencies inside inside the patterns, neural networks that can extract patterns from from data and operate on them, uh, behavior trees that that mix patterns and and processes with a grammar that makes sense of how they can interact, uh, and there there is a lot of stuff uh, and and the idea is more complexity, more depth, more understanding uh, uh, of uh, these three elements and more and more. Uh, uh, mixing of these three elements. Um, so another dimension, and I will regroup these two because, uh, well, we only have the means to display a 3D space on this screen, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, the, the, other, um, the, other, the other dimension is um, uh, the relationship between human and machine. And we've been talking, and Taro has been talking a little bit uh, about this. Um, and it's, it's essentially uh, uh, who is doing which part of the work and how the, act, the actors interact, uh, be they uh, machine or, or, um, or humans. And at the beginning of time, um, the human did everything. So you had to understand that your car had bro broken, broken down. Uh, the humans wrote the rule, they had the expertise, that's where the expert comes from. Uh, and uh, and they wrote the rules and and you had to check them yourself 
the process was the human does something and feeds the information back into the system. Um, we've evolved a lot uh, since then, and you have very complex uh, interaction now, such as with deep learning, when you extract the machine extract patterns from data set uh, given by a human, and the patterns are used by, by the machine uh, and, and presented to the, to the human, they can feed them back to do something like, like I don't know, recognize cats from dogs, uh, but uh, but also uh, we'll see we'll see later a filter data data set uh, using this knowledge that is fabricated by, by the machine. So so a lot of interaction. I won't go into details uh, because it could be it could be a, a talk on its own. But essentially, it is the interactivity dimension. And when you go down this dimension. Um, you get more complexity, more reflexivity, which means that the system looks at itself, it sees how it's working and can reason on how it's working. Um, more agency, uh, you can do stuff, more stuff and, and stuff that has more meaning. Uh, and expressiveness, you can transfer your intention and what you want to do into the, into the system. And depth, uh, you can have representation of the world that makes more sense, uh, be it uh, at the meaning level or at the abstraction level. Now with the creative process. Um, so to, to, to find a dimension, uh, a suitable dimension, I choose this one. There are a lot of models <clears throat> of what creatives do. And, and Reggie Van Hoek uh, wrote this one, which is good. And the, the names are cool. So, so uh, I chose uh, this one, uh, but, but it's basically all of them uh, explain that the artist, when he, when he creates, uh, goes through four or five stages and and in this in this model there are uh, four stages first you're the explorer and the explorer gather gathers data um, you find stuff that can feed your creative process and then you're the artist and the artist combines what what the, the explorer has found uh, in new patterns in new ways um, then you have the judge, and the judge looks at this and says, okay, what is worth pursuing? What, what has value and what must be thrown out? And then you're the warrior. When you're the warrior, you do the work. You, you don't um, question anymore. This is what you have to do. And, and, and uh, you apply all the, all the rules uh, uh, on the data that you've selected and uh, the new ID and you create. Actually, you create actually something, not just an idea of something. Um, and in the, the development process that you are familiar with, uh, the explorer is about research, inspiration, brainstorming, serendipity. Uh, the artist is about goals, constraints, innovation, design. The judge is about prototyping, testing, validation, ex and exploiting the opportunities uh, that you can find while you are creating stuff uh, or, or because the world changes around you. And the warrior is about development, polish, revision, uh, and constraint solving. Um, so, of course, you don't work like that if you're a creative. Uh, you, you, you are on the spectrum and you have different roles uh, at different times. For instance, um, uh, Tolkien doesn't work like Martin at all uh, because he's dead. Uh, <laughs> and, but but the, way, the way he created The Lord of the Rings um, is very different from the way that Martin is writing uh, sort of ice and fire. Um, you, could, you could say that, that the explorer part for, for Tolkien is much more important because, because his story is just a, a, a simple output of all the work he did to create a new myth for, for, for uh, England. Uh, and, and how he did that is by uh, fabricating the, the mythology, the languages, and, and, and associating new ideas together uh, to, to create this myth. And, and then when you get to the judging part and the warrior part, uh, you have less energy to, 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 uh, to spend uh, to, to get a, a beautiful uh, book. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, Martin is famous for rewriting each chapter dozens and dozens of times uh, so that when he finds something that he judges good, uh, he can he can create uh, the the stories that is needed for this chapter to work, uh, and uh, and the explorer the explorer part is less important for him. But but this is a trick. This is a trick because 
uh, Tolkien was able to uh, write uh, so uh, with so little uh, uh, energy here because he spent a lot of warrior energy there, and and uh, he's able to judge and and write what sounds right to him uh, because he has a, an, an extremely deep knowledge of. Uh, um, Political intrigues and and uh, and, uh, and wars in the uh, in the 14th and 15th centuries in Europe. So so it's it's a it's a mix of this. Uh, I say that the dimension I wrote that the dimensions are, are non-linear and that's why. Plus, it's a recursive process. When you are in the act of creation, actually, um, even if you are the full artist, you know about your art. So you have guiding principles. You have a judge that is that is in the background. Um, and this judge has been fed by your research, looking at other artists and your personal experience, your, your success and your failures. And, and the way you chose these to look at certain artists or, or to, to take on certain projects it has been fed by your intuition, which is your, 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 your artist back again. Um, and, and you could do that at, at every stage. Uh, so, so you are all these dimensions, but but uh, but you need to be all these people uh, at at, uh, at any time. And if you want to break the mold, if you want to be innovative, in your you have to feed your judge something that is not that. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, that's your artist that has to influence the, the judge. Uh, a recursive process. Uh, and the last dimension is the level of abstractions for the problem and, and output. What I mean by that is that most of what we've been talking about today. Uh, is about the what level, the level of things and meanings. This is what you care about, and this is what you output. Uh, but there are other levels of abstraction that we can think about. Um, the how level, how you do stuff. So what what is what stuff you get, and the how level, how you do stuff. The, the level of methodology, tools, and techniques. And there is another level above that is how do you use that uh, to change the world, and and that's the level of uh, or your art. And that's a level of purpose and, and transcendence. Um, to, to, to give some perspective to, to these two dimensions, uh, you, you can see uh, in this grid, uh, you have the four steps uh, of, uh, of uh, the creative process and the three abstraction uh, layers. And um, so you start here. You start with uh, Da Vinci trying to understand how to represent the world. And when you know how to represent the world, you can use that uh, to create allegories. And when you understand that you can uh, have meaning that is not representative, you get to um, symbolism with Bosch. And when uh, it's not, it's not the chronological uh, And and to the point where you uh, can, uh, like with the uh, Dutch school, represent um, a person's whole life in one painting, because you've combined all this. Um, and then when you go up in abstraction, uh, you have, as with Magritte, um, art that talks about the tricks, the techniques that you use, or uh, art that talks about the process, or art uh, that talks about the aesthetics, or art, art that talks about, okay, when you take all of this, how can you please the mind by creating things that you've never seen before? And um, and when you go up again, um, you have transcendence. How do you change art? Mondry, uh, um, Monet that didn't want to represent what he saw, but want, wanted to represent what he felt. Or, or Picasso, who wanted to use art as a conduit for raw emotion. Or Duchamp, that, that redefined what art meant, and art active artifacts. Or Dali, that showed us how art could screw with our, with our brains. Um, and each of these artists are stuck in these boxes. Uh, actually, each artist, just like with the creative process, uh, follows a journey through these. And, and even each piece could be at, at, in several places in this. Uh, Magritte, uh, you can find uh, uh, pieces uh, uh, of his everywhere uh, in this space. Uh, okay, so how do we combine these two things? Um, we've already been using creative AI, uh, AI and creativity for a while. Uh, even if it's in the 
origin of our uh, space. Um, there are things out there that have totally changed the way we deal with uh, the Explorer phase. Uh, the data is indexed by a machine, and, and it changed the way we search things, we explore things. I couldn't do a, a presentation uh, the same way if I didn't have a Google image. Um, and, and, this, and, and there are many techniques that, that are already available to, to the general public, especially in video games with procedural generation, when you have uh, uh, a, pr a simple process that uses parts created by humans to create an uh, uh, experience that have a high level of quality because it's, it's been designed. But it's still very close to the origin of the, uh, of, um, the world. This is the most popular game in the world, and it follows the same principles. But instead of using uh, pieces, because th these pieces are uh, immutable from, from game to game. But instead of using pieces, it uses a process to define what the world should be like. Um, and, and it can go very far. So the, this, is, this is a wider thing, the thing that I do stuff, but you can also have uh, the, the judge uh, uh, at work uh, with, uh, with the, the designer saying, okay, these are the patterns of the emotional uh, curve that I want to create and use uh, bits of, um, of content to, to create this curve uh, by, by analyzing what's going on in, in, the, in the, the game. So there is a, an additional level of reflexivity. Uh, so we are a little bit further than the interaction uh, axis. Uh, and the experience is totally different. The, con the content is created to influence your emotions directly, gener generated to influence your, your emotions. Um, a little bit closer to, to, to us, um, you can have machines that extract patterns from uh, from uh, uh, data uh, and and generate from from there like uh, this wave function collapse. Uh, so you don't have to explain the rules. The patterns are, are found by the machine and and it tries to to generate stuff that looks like what it's seen. Um, so we we've we've uh, listened to what can be done in music. So so uh, I I won't go into details, but the idea is that. There are experts, there are musicians or, or, or technicians about what music should be, and they're able to create patterns that can be used to generate music automatically. And this is a very different, oh, this is similar to, to, to this, uh, but, but at a higher level of abstraction because, because we're, we're talking uh, about how music works. Um, and, and we can even use uh, these principles to judge the generated music, uh, saying, okay, if this kind of generated music looks like or sounds like uh, or, or share certain uh, characteristics with uh, classical music, for instance. Um, and, um, and you can combine these patterns created by humans saying, okay, in an office, uh, a conference room should be near, uh, should be far from the cubicles, but near the entrance and the entrance should have these categories. So that you generate thousands of, of possible throw plots that can be checked against uh, a, a judge that has been fed uh, by a human. Um, and deep learning uh, is basically the extension of, of that uh, to the machine. Uh, you extract uh, these patterns instead of having them provided by, by uh, the human uh, so that uh, the, uh, the, the machine can, can uh, uh, operate on them. So we we talked about site transfer uh, uh, and uh, and how uh, how it can combine. Literally, it's, it's the artist of uh, Van Gogh combine two ideas to create something new. Um, and uh, what it, what is interesting is that it's a new way for the artist to do something. So you you suddenly you explore the space by feeding the system uh, data, just data. Uh, and, and you have interesting things. So as an artist, your, your role as an explorer uh, uh, is, to, is to find two things that you, th that you think would be interesting to match. And, and the experience with, uh, the, gene, the, with the camera, it's, it's exactly that. It's, oh, I'm surprised, something new. Um, and two weeks ago, you, you had, uh, you had uh, Microsoft uh, Research publish uh, something about something that, that could be uh, uh, a new path in this uh, in this uh, space, 
which is, okay, you have two images, the, the images that they give uh, are the first and the last, and, and as a human, you, you're saying, okay, there is a pattern. Now, can you give me a style transfer from this to this, that is close to this, and from this to this, that is close to, to this? So can you extract what is unique about this image that is not this image and, and put it into the image and vice versa? Um, it's it's the, the only way that you can do that is by understanding how this image and that image are the same. So basically you have to recreate patterns. The, the human tells you that there are patterns and you have to find them. This, 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 if this works, uh, at, uh, on complex problem at, uh, in the future, this would be revolutionary. Um, so we, we, we <laughs> talked about Deep Dream. Um, Jim talked about Deep Dream. Uh, Deep Dream is the stuff of my parents, uh, but, but still it's very interesting um, because what it does is you, you have to feed Deep Dream something so that, that it can recognize patterns. Uh, you can't, you, the dream wouldn't find dogs in uh, in a, a plate of uh, spaghetti meatballs if it didn't know about dogs. So you can feed the system saying, "Okay, look at this uh, this plate and find me dogs." And the dream will find dogs. Um, but but it's, today it's it's just crazy, stupid, uh, and nightmarish uh, images. But images. But imagine what uh, you could do with this. Uh, uh, enhancing images uh, or, or applying uh, or, or pattern recognition in images uh, using the same technique. And art, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so um, and also the, the idea of having an arithmetic uh, that, uh, that can be applied to, uh, to, to, these, uh, to these patterns, which means that uh, you provide um, the set, the data set, but as uh, uh, an artist, you speak to the machine about the patterns that both you and, I, and, and, and it understand. There is a shared language here saying, I, I know you understand blue and I know you understand red, so remove the blue from this car and find me cars that are red instead. Um, so this, this, is, this is very new uh, and, by, and with deep learning, this, this set of uh, vocabulary um, that is shared can be extracted. Um, so th this is very powerful for exploration and for creative. Uh, and, uh, and when you add the idea that you can have uh, some kind of, of uh, style transfer uh, across categories of, of uh, items, uh, like uh, you, you have a set of bags and a set of shoes and you can take a bag and change the shoes so that it, they match, um, suddenly, what you can do is the exploration that we, that we talked about earlier can be done in a generated space, not just on images that you had before. Um, so, okay, we have this, we've, we've mapped this space. Where, where, do we, where do we go from here? Um, well, up, up, and away. Uh, so, up and up is about climbing the, the ladder of abstraction, and away is about uh, going toward more uh, interaction. Uh, climbing the, the ladder of abstraction requires humans today. Today, we're not good enough uh, that we can extract the art from pixels. Uh, we can find regularities, we can transfer uh, uh, styles, but we can't explain how art is done and we can't explain why art is done just by looking at art. Maybe someday we, we will be able to do that, but today we can't. So uh, there, must, there must be humans in the process. Um, and basically, you have to make the machine understand what's going on here. And there are two ways of doing that. And, and they should be combined in, in, in my mind. Um, the first is to create tools for artists uh, that let them um, edit, create, and share uh, data. Uh, but not only data, also patterns and processes and, and methodologies and intentions about their art. And what I mean by that is, okay, you have an artist and, and he is using a tool and this tool lets the artist 
talk about, okay, here's how I'm designing a cartoon animal, or here's how I'm designing a school, or here's how I change this image to make it uh, feel sad. Um, and the time process is very important so that you understand what's going on. And you have a, you have a judge, a machine judge, that tries to extract knowledge from all this. Um, imagine how powerful such a tool would be. Uh, if you knew how, to, if you were good at, uh, at drawing cartoon animals and you could share the cartoon animal pattern and the cartoon animal process and, and why cartoon can animal is cute uh, to other people. Oh, I'm dead. Uh, uh, this, would be, this would be extremely powerful. Um, so that, that's this part, the shared language. The other part is let's ask artists. Uh, there are a lot of people that have already uh, written about what this vocabulary is. Let's teach this vocabulary to machines. Uh, and because a lot of people have talked about how you tell stories uh, and, and why they're powerful, or how you draw comics, or, or what are the design, the, the characteristics of good uh, design interface, or architecture, or food, or cooking, or, rep or, or data representation. So we could take these patterns and, and uh, teach them to the machine so that we come at the problem from both sides, from the pixels and from what, what they need and how they should work. Um, and we could even do that, not, not only with the judge, but with the artist, help uh, uh, the creativity of the artist by, by uh, using methods like Brian Eno's uh, public strategy that, that gives you ran, random constraints or, or exploring the culture through symbols uh, and, and feeding, feeding the, the, this to, to, uh, to the machine. And, and so this is a, a way is moving toward the Engelbart space. Uh, what is the Engelbart space? Uh, it's Engelbart is the guy who invented basically uh, all the concepts that we used to do in modern comp computing. But, but his goal was to have a tool that allow people to collaborate and, and not only collaborate, but understand how they collaborate, how they can improve their collaboration, and, and uh, how this process uh, can even be improved. Um, and uh, what he didn't uh, know that is that AI could be part of this. Uh, and uh, from Google Image, we could have a loop uh, of interactivity uh, that would allow us to explore better um, and give feedback to the machine uh, with the shared uh, the shared language that I was talking about, so that we can diverge and explore, or converge and judge uh, when uh, when we need, and we can talk about our why we're doing that and and uh, and the patterns we want to apply to our work. Uh, we've seen that the beginning of the of the uh, um, vocabulary and techniques is here. Uh, we just need more, and uh, and work is done in in this. But we can go beyond the Ingabat space. The Ingabat space is uh, a beacon, a guiding light, but we can go beyond that um, because he couldn't envision everything, even if he was a genius. Um, and beyond that is to treat uh, the actors in the interaction uh, and, and the creation um, as, uh, as part of a, a process um, that is mediated by a machine, but a process that deals with wide patterns and process, not just data. Uh, so uh, the facilitation, mediation, and enhancement of creative collaboration across all domains, uh, and and because it's hanging about uh, uh, how to improve this process. But, but this means that we can share these how to how to draw the cute animals, and it has meaning across across several actors, and and we can we can build on that. So I hope I have convinced you that the, this space is big. We've only scratched the surface, and we have to be very optimistic about where we can. Thank you. Cool. So we leave the questions for the roundtable. People are still up for that. So people uh, can leave or, or stay if you're. Yeah. Uh, so we'll put some chairs. We'll take a few minutes. So go and stretch your legs if you want. What? Okay. Can, can. Yeah.
Oh, no, no, I'm going to ask all the general questions, so maybe times that I ask more specific. Yeah. But yeah, I'll ask <laughs> Just let me know. I love that. It's only recently. I'm still recovering. Oh shit, you guys are chatting, so we're starting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are chatting, so we're starting. Okay. All right, we're going to start everyone, so if everyone wants to just take their seats. What's up? We're going to play ABBA again. <laughs> I see people rushing away because they, they don't want to get ABBA. Oh, you do. <laughs> if you'd all like to come join us back again and we'll start doing the panel questions. No, no. But then they don't. Go ahead. All right, so I kind of have some questions based on your presentation. So a um, little bit on presentations, a little bit on what I know about all of you. Um, so I just wondered, like, our audience is obviously quite diverse. Um, we may not all be like machine learning engineers, etc. That's kind of the falsity of AI. Like, 
do you have to be a machine learning engineer really to be part of AI? Um, so you're working very different areas. So I just wondered, like, what was your process to coming to Creative AI yourself and being within that area? Oh, um, my, what was my process to getting into it, into it? Uh, for me, it was like a bit accidental because I was working in AI in a much more like I guess you could say functional capacity. I was working with a startup. We had a product that was you know using machine learning for information retrieval. But then I was also doing. I always had this interest in breaking things apart and doing things like uh, I don't know maybe like offbeat projects with machine learning and then doing things like processing. So being at that doing those two things always gave me ideas of going back and forth between them and like applying what I learned in one to the other. Um, and also feeling like that was something that needed to be done because there's lots of eyes that are on machine learning for, you know, various sort of like commercial industrial applications. But then, um, but then I'd also would like to see like machine learning much more democratized and like uh, uh, for, for more people to be engaging with it because it has an impact on everybody, whether they know it or not. And so I'm always trying to like think do things that have a little bit more of like you know wide appeal, I guess. That's the wide net. So creativity is like a common denominator for everybody, right? Um, everyone likes to be creative, so that's kind of one approach to it. Yeah. So the way I got into this field was uh, I was organizing events, looking at how you can bring new business models and technology into the arts industry. And then somebody thought that, you know, kind of computer vision was in some way related to what I was looking into. And uh, yeah, I just found it so fascinating. And uh, then I've always been interested in the arts and I also, you know, wanted to be an artist. And, you know, there was this technology that can ultimately automate so much so I can just claim to be the artist without actually doing much. And I found that really exciting. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of what drove me to start researching into this field and uh, doing my work. Um, I I started role playing when I, when I was a kid, and to me, um, I, I quickly uh, re realized that there were rules making interesting stories or interesting worlds. And to me, AI has always been about creativity because this, this is what I wanted to do: uh, take those rules and make things with them. Uh, so AI has always been a um, uh, means to an end to me. So I've been, I'm a web developer. I'm still not considering my, myself much as someone who's in the AI world. I am in the world, but I just don't understand anything, anything about it. Let's work with people who do. That's my, my strategy here. But, uh, but you're definitely of, part of it. So. Yeah, I'm becoming <laughs> part of it. My, my approach really has been that I, I'm very much interested in generative music in general, especially the Brian Eno School of Generative Music, who has this, this idea of how, what are the ways of making music without having to do very much. Like that's a kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of lazy, lazy approach to, to things which he has, which I'm, I've been following. And, and as, as part of that, ways of create, generating variety in music or, or visual arts. And AI seems to be a very fruit, fruitful way to do that currently. The, the, Deep learning things and things like that, but but really magnetic tape as well. You know, it's 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 not about the tools really for me. I think that's really interesting to see such a diverse kind of group, like in terms of like doing things for the community. You know, being a front end engineer, etc., and picking up your own personal projects as well. Like that variety really it really does show you that people can get involved in their AI kind of industry, um, like regardless of right where you really sit right now. Which is uh, yeah, it's very cool. It's very promising. Um, so in terms of like, uh, basically AI recently, like we've known for many years, like machine learning has been underlying all of these recommendation systems like Netflix and so on. But it feels like over the last few years, it's become like very mainstream, like almost like a buzzword, really. So what are your kind of thoughts in terms of AI surfacing to more of like a mainstream audience through these very visible tools, um, like the ones that Google has, for example, with AI experiments, etc. In what sense, like what? Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts in terms of like that movement from taking it from like a very kind of like research or hidden, mm -hmm. almost like hidden into the company's backbones in terms of being more um, front end and more kind of like visible to an audience? Right. Uh, well, I'd say like to some degree it's inevitable because 
uh, again, like it's it's such a cliche by now, but I I like to say it anyway because it bears repeating. Like machine learning affects all of us. So like you know, if you if you uh, interact with Facebook at all, you know you, that's interact that's that's controlling the way that uh, you consume news. If you interact with Google, that you know where you get all your information in the world. Uh, you know, if you ever go up to an ATM, you're interacting with machine learning, and so it's become of more interest to people because they realize like it has such a huge influence on many aspects of their lives. And so I think to some degree, the, the, those companies, that's a response to growing demand to um, actually, you know, create some more um, transparency about what, how those things are. So I think it's like a good trend. I'd like to see it accelerated. Of course, like there's always going to be a tug of war between us the, um, and, and the companies, but um, you know, the, I, I think the more people know, the more they demand, because like the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And, uh, you know, like if people realize the kind of information you can infer about somebody from, from almost no data, uh, you know, social media data, if people actually knew that at a mass scale, they would, uh, they would ask for more of this kind of stuff uh, because otherwise people, it's kind of like a lot of people don't necessarily realize that it's not just a niche technology anymore. Yeah, so I have to say, I think I actually got into this field with the mainstream. So I first became aware of it when a lot of my machine learning friends started sending me links to all these works generated by Deep Dream. And, um, and yeah, so I think it's great that more and more people are being aware of uh, what the tools and the techniques and the opportunities are. And uh, yeah, you never know how they will use them, what ideas they will come up with. So I think that's definitely a very positive movement. And uh, I also think like, even if you look at all these um, art and AI projects that come across, ultimately, maybe not all of us will find all of them very interesting, but you know, the fact that there are more and more of them happening will hopefully raise the bar and increase the quality at some point as well. So that's my view. Um, so we the, the mainstream question is very interesting because um, um, we everybody here has experiences even if they don't know with AI, and and the only time they know they are interacting with AI is when it fails. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when Netflix records something weird, or or where when Siri doesn't understand the context, uh, and. What this means to me is that the public is sensing that we're in the gray box and they want to get out. Uh, and, and they want to, to talk about context. They want to be more part of the interaction with AIs. And today AIs are just about the stuff, they're just about objects. Uh, and and there, there is this need that is starting to, to appear because we're gaining the, this, this uh, understanding that we are dealing with AIs all the time. Yeah, to, to me, it seems like the way the mainstream is approaching this is not really as thinking of it as AI at all. It's just through the apps that come about using those. For example, I have a friend who is an arts teacher, teaches children uh, visual arts, and um, I tried to explain to her what I was doing, and then she saw her eyes glazing, glazing up because just, there's no connection there really, or at least I couldn't make it. But then, then we talked about neural style and, and things that that it is able to do and she had actually been using that with children without actually realizing that's an AI thing or machine learning thing. So it isn't, doesn't seem to be a discussion point AI at all. It's just the things that people are able to do that interest them. That's fantastic. Um, so obviously you're all interested in like art itself and music. So I'm just wondering, uh, for many years, we've obviously had like AI kind of surfacing in terms of artwork. So Aaron, for example, is a painting robot that was done in the 80s, I believe, by Harold Cohen, um, who unfortunately sadly passed away last year. We also had the painting fall by um, someone else, a researcher over in London called The Painting Fall as well. Um, yes, yeah, Simon Colton. Um, so those are kind of like two very kind of like known artistic, artistic robots, you could say, that really do paint and they're very, early sessions in terms of this kind of uh, computational creativity and creative AI. And I just wondered, for, for so many years, we've had artists and we've had musicians known for their work and known for their skill and known for um, their trade, really. So what is your thoughts in terms of um, just 
AI and that kind of form of collaboration really having and maintaining the same kind of reputation that an artist would have done. Because in many ways, it you know, people love to see the fact that something's taken time, right? So Picasso would spend weeks and months on a piece of artwork, whereas an AI, you know, you can do that in like a, if you're lucky, a couple of minutes, or if you're training something, probably a couple of days or a couple of hours. Um, so what are your thoughts in terms of reputation, AI artworks, music really being taken seriously? Um, so before making a lot of visual art with, with AI, I was working a lot in this field, generative art, which is kind of, which is also, you know, the same thing. It's generative in some sense, except it's using like procedural algorithms instead of uh, things that you can kind of define instead of instead of machine learning. But um, the response of the, like the art world, quote unquote, to, to, to anything like this kind of digital art is usually like, um, that it doesn't really belong in the art market because it's reproducible, so easily reproducible. Um, the art market does not like re easy reproducibility. Um, and so doing things with AI, it just takes that to uh, like more extreme level. And so consequently, like people who do anything similar to what I do, um, even though we say like I'm an artist or, or whatever, uh, we uh, or we're totally have zero interaction with the art market or the art world, um, which I'm, I'm you know, like that's that's kind of that's a lost cause. Uh, so um, I actually I'm t I'm sort of I guess I'm sort of like agnostic or I don't care so much like a bit because I I don't really like you know authorship is a really big deal to artists like okay who is the author and who is where is the originality come from and the thing is like if you look at it and you you know you go into detail you see that the whole notion of authorship is very compl complicated. And it's always been complicated, like even a paintbrush, you, know, you didn't make it, right? It came from the ground. Um, I mean, parts of it came from the ground, parts of it came from who knows where, right? No, no, there was a nice presentation someone made, like, I forget who the name is. So no one knows how to make a pencil, something like that. Um, and, and so art is always like trying to cover that up. I mean, the, every, the way production works is just so much more complicated, it involves so many more people that I think it's pointless to reconstruct them. So, there are questions I kind of leave, leave aside and... <laughs> yeah, so I guess in terms of uh, AI in the art world, I think there is, uh, yeah, there's very interesting crossover. So in terms of the latest, uh, you know, artworks and trends kind of starting off with the Google Deep Dream and style transfer, it seems very much that, you know, the corporate tech world or Google have, has, you know, been at the forefront but now some of the art world institutions are also catching up. So the Tate did an IK prize themed in AI last year. Then uh, a few of the art festivals, including the new media festival Transmediale in Berlin had AI as one of the themes. And of course, Ars Electronica will be themed in AI this year. So it's to me, it's, it's clear that there are major institutions from the art world that are showing interest in this field, just because also contemporary art is so broad. And even as, as you mentioned, a lot of the, I suppose, generative art or, you know, phot photographic art can, um, can be quite reproducible and can consist of, let's say, many objects. Uh, on the commercial side, I know that's sometimes dealt with by selling a work in additions. And uh, I guess, I think art created by computers has, well, you know, you mentioned kind of Aaron and, and some others, maybe it never kind of reached the mass market enough for, um, for, for great financial and kind of product offerings to be developed to sell this art at auction houses or mass galleries. And I know the digital art community is still, you know, struggling how to even sell, you know, art that kind of moves on a screen. So to me, that's very exciting. And uh, I'd like to see kind of how, how, how that is tackled in the future. So in, in my presentation, I, I showed um, a painting of Jackson Pollock. Uh, and people didn't get Jackson Pollock until they got it. Uh, and and he used um, physics as a tool, uh, and and we can use uh, other artists can use AI as a tool. Uh, 
only what's missing is the, the communicating the fact that the artist is making things, he's making choices, uh, because even if uh, products through pen, paint was still an artist, he still made choices. So if you have a piece of art that you can see is a result of uh, the artist's choices, even if the machine has done it, it's still art. And I mean, and and people like um, screensavers, <laughs> so so I'm I'm fine with that at some point. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking along very similar lines. Uh, also, for the examples I had about those musicians was that it was all about taking their own vision and kind of amplifying that and augmenting that and whatever tools were available available for doing that, they used an AI as, as soon as it becomes something that an artist or a musician or whoever can take and express what they want to express anyway, but maybe in a kind of new new way, that will be it. And it won't be necessarily, again, Call AI maybe at that point. It's just art that these people do, and AI is a tool for them. Yeah, it's very interesting that we talk about this in terms of collaboration and augmentation rather than the concept of automation, because we all know that the press has blown that up. So it's all about automating this, automating that, and reality is it is a tool really, which is fantastic. Um, just one final question from me, really, which is very much about what do you see as the major kind of issues or problems that may arise within the next couple of years within creative AI? Because right now it, it's very much like, a, I guess, a new field, very growing, very developing. Uh, I'm sure at some stage, like things may slow or may fall. Um, so, yeah, that would be interesting to hear. The, the problems that will arise. Um, I think probably the problems that will arise are not different. So, I mean, the, the core problems are not so different than the kind of problems that arise in other fields. So like whenever a thing sort of breaks into the mainstream, it, it's, it gets, you know, there's, uh, there becomes a lot more opportunities to kind of, to try to, um, I don't know, misuse it or, or they're to try to like, uh, well, of course, like one of the big things that's happened in AI in the, in the past is overhype. Um, which is, of course, buried it. I mean, in the '70s and '80s, for for a long time, there's a lot of incentive um, to oversell a product, which uh, you know has all sorts of undersides that you know it's not particularly in anyone's best interest to tell to tell people about. And of course, like that, that can lead to a lot of unintended uh, bad consequences, things that are not evaluated. Um, in terms of like how they might negatively impact certain certain people, um, that kind of stuff is like. Of course, that's not unique to AI. That's that's really anything. But um, with AI, of course, the, the stakes are so much higher because it's such a high. Um, obviously, like the, the the amount of money that's going into AI technology is is astronomical right now, and it's only growing. So the stakes are much higher, and yeah, I mean the the solutions to those are 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 again, like not really, it doesn't have to do with the AI itself. It's, it's, it's more a question of like creating the right incentive structures to try to remove um, profit motives from activities that are, that are, that are harmful, um, which, you know, of course, like I can, there's all sorts of industries that I would go after first <laughs> with, with respect to that. But of course, AI is not immune to that. So I would say it's a, it's a problem of how we, you know, structure things and governance and, creating ordinances and so on. Yeah, so in terms uh, of the problems, uh, just from running my meetup where I see, you know, artists, creators and technologies come together, there are various uh, questions or issues uh, that I kind of hear from the uh, art and creative community that, you know, I originally wouldn't expect. So I know that some of them are worried, are very worried about uh, the fact that this kind of uniformization. So I know there was this, um, was it the quick draw tool where you could, you know, sketch a cat and then the, the, this, this Google tool would bring up uh, this image of a cat, you know, so in some ways it helped you to realize your vision of uh, getting a cat down on a piece of paper. But on the other hand, it kind of reduced all these possible variations of, 
you know, cat faces and cat bodies you could have uh, come up with when you were trying to make it happen. So I think to me that just uh, can, can kind of shows how there are, you know, so many different perspectives on a technology and whether something ultimately becomes problematic is how it is used. So if you're looking at uh, kind of uh, simplifying and optimizing your um, your design process, then something like that could be very helpful. But if you're looking at, uh, you know, brainstorming and maybe looking at how you can depict this real life cat on paper with, with, with exactly what you mean, then this is probably not the right tool for it. And uh, yeah, I guess it's a, it's a question of uh, bringing in the, the perspectives of uh, various strands of the community into the creation of these AI tools, which is something that I think is missing. So kind of the diversity issue, the fact that we need more kind of women, more minorities, more, you know, people perhaps with an artistic point of view when we develop these tools. Um, so I think creating AI will climb the, the uh, levels of, of abstraction, uh, of abstraction, and so we will reach the purpose level. So we will make generative art about stuff, and and some people have evil purposes. Uh, so there is a risk for um, manipulation and indoctrination, uh, and and to me this doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that. It means that we should have an ethical way of doing that, and that the tools that I talked about should be freely available to to anyone to increase purpose literacy uh, in in the general public. It's needed. Uh, all the stuff about fake news uh, uh, shows that that we we need it, uh, and this is a way to to achieve it. So I think the only thing I can add to that is um, what I see as a risk is that we are very much always approaching this, these things, technology first, so we're thinking what is possible with, with uh, style transfer and things like that. Um, and as long as we keep doing that, we, we are not approaching it from the perspective of, of the creative people who are already working in the industries, like, like designers, and artists, and musicians. And I think we need to flip that around a little bit and, and approach it from their angle and see where we could meet somewhere in the middle because as long as we, we do tech first, I, I, I think there's a risk of uh, uh, this remaining a kind of niche thing. Yeah, great answers. So I want to open up the uh, floor for questions. So does anyone in the audience have anything that they'd like to ask any of our panel? Whether or not that be all of them, or specifically anyone, maybe a question from their presentation at all? Can be allowed anything. Okay, go on, Alex. <laughs> So it's a, an opt-in question. You don't have to answer it. What is the most embarrassing or horrible or surprising thing you've seen one of your AI or machine learning creations do? Any embarrassing or funny stories? <laughs> For me, it's just most of it is shit. What my creations do is it's about finding the one percent that's decent. <laughs> Perfect. Gene, I'm surprised you haven't got more stories of all I, your slacks and well, your ducks and your. Well, a lot of a lot of the things I do are like almost purposely embarrassing. So yeah. Like, <laughs> the thing that I posted today, like I've been putting up a lot of like stuff with my face. <laughs> so, accidentally, accidentally uh, uh, surprising. Yeah, yeah, that's why. That's why I didn't think that that actually fit. So like, I'm trying to think. Give me, a, give me a few minutes. <laughs> It's a really good question. I just like I somehow bad at reflection. Anybody else? <laughs> I don't think I need it. Have you seen anything with a written work, you know, poetry or uh, novels or something? Yeah, like Ruby. Yeah, actually, I have. <laughs> so um, I uh, trained a recurrent neural network on T. S. Eliot's poetry. Um, it was very much about the concept of whether or not a poet can live on a past death. So um, we've seen like more recently uh, things like text to speech abilities and basically being able to, <coughs> sorry, imitate people's, <laughs> about to have a coughing fit. Um, we've seen very recently that we can imitate voices as well. So very much can we imitate what people would actually say. Um, things like the, the 
so T.S. Eliot, for those of you who don't know, he, he uses a lot of like metaphors and uh, very, very strong in imagery and refers to tales in Egypt across the whole world. Um, and we actually, you know, we can create it to, so that it's actually quite a high level in terms of uh, people uh, missing, misread it as being T.S. Eliot from um, my studies and, and the work I put out, really. And then I believe Jean's actually done a current neural network as well as part of your ML for artists as well, where I took some inspiration. So that was that was very good and very handy. Okay, so do we have any more questions from the audience? Okay, I think in that case we will start wrapping up. Um, so thank you very much for the organisers who have been absolutely fantastic. Oh, thank you, Rola. Uh, <laughs> he knows that he's got the cue. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the organisers for um, really sourcing this event, and thank you really for all of our speakers that have flown into the, this, this event and for work purposes as well. It's been a it's been a really fantastic evening. Um, hopefully, you've all um, enjoyed a lot of it and obviously learned a lot and hopefully met some of the people in the room. So um, feel free to hang around for the next five, 10 minutes just to get some contacts, you know, have some chats and so on. And um, yeah, we'll wish you good night. Thank you. Um, and so probably most of us will go to a bar somewhere nearby and whoever wants to join can join. Okay. Oh, there you go. Sorry, Rod, if I messed up that part. You must have tons of stories about I systems know. that have gone wrong. <laughs> I can see it's going to be absolutely When it's, can I, can I, can I, I have to say, it's just a friend. Like, no, but it's, it's, it's a whole crap work, so. Oh, I see. Okay. Am I wrong? <laughs> so, I don't feel like that.